we go. Hi, I'm Steve Hewitt from the University of Birmingham uh, in the UK, and I'm here today with Professor Ron Divert of the University of Toronto, and I believe a fellow Canadian as well. And we're here to have a quick chat uh, in connection to the documentary film Black Code, which will be airing at the Screening Rights Film Festival on the 27th of October. Unfortunately, Ron couldn't join us there in person, uh, but he's um, very graciously agreed to have a, a chat. Um, and uh, the film's director, uh, Nick DePensier, will be at the roundtable, which I'll be chairing after the screening of the film. So welcome, Ron. Thanks for Thanks joining for me here on um, I guess it's a Wednesday afternoon in the middle of September. Uh, so if you could just uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, that would be great. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a professor of political science, cross-appointed to the Monk School of Global Affairs here at the University of Toronto. Uh, my area of specialization is international security and information technology. Uh, I've been working in that area uh, going back to my uh, doctorate at the University of British Columbia, um, which ended up being my first book, Parchment Printing and Hypermedia. Um, after that book was completed, I, I wanted to explore interdisciplinary approaches to investigating security issues uh, having to do with information technology, and that's when I started uh, Citizen Lab, which I founded in 2001. Right, and could you tell us a little bit about Citizen Lab? Citizen Lab is uh, quite a unique uh, place. It started out literally as a professor's lab. Um, a colleague of mine, when I uh, had an opportunity, some funding from a foundation uh, to uh, start some interdisciplinary projects in this area, a colleague suggested rather than a center or an institute, I set up a lab. Uh, in social sciences, it's not very common to, for a professor to have a lab. Uh, I thought this was a cool idea. And so um, uh, that's how it started. It uh, remains a lab to this day. There are about uh, 15 full-time staff. Most of them have expertise um, and backgrounds in computer science, engineering, um, law, area studies, um, graphic design, um, data visualization. And what we do is we combine methods to do research on digital security issues that arise out of human rights concerns. So we uh, track uh, cyber espionage against human rights organizations. Uh, we've done that for many years. Uh, we uh, reverse engineer. We take apart applications to better understand whether there might be some privacy or security risks embedded in those applications. Uh, for example, uh, about a decade ago, we uh, reverse engineered the Chinese version of the very application we're speaking on now, Skype, and found that uh, hidden within the Skype application was a keyword surveillance system. So if you typed in the chat, uh, keywords like Tiananmen or Falun Gong, they simply uh, wouldn't appear. Right, and that, um, I mean, you've written a book which, I mean, focuses on Citizen Lab and some of these issues, which is called Black Code. And is that how you became involved in the documentary? Was it a case that you were approached and um, someone read the book and thought it was worthwhile turning into a documentary? Yeah, uh, so Nick DePontier, the director of Black Code, uh, happens to be a, uh, we, we have a, a mutual friend, and I had met Nick. Nick on a couple of occasions. Uh, he and his wife, Jennifer Bejewal, are um, quite prominent Canadian filmmakers, and I had uh, seen a couple of his films, especially Watermark, uh, which impressed me very much. And uh, when the book came out, there were a few filmmakers that wanted to do documentary versions uh, of documentary adaptations of the book, and I definitely, uh, we have a lot of experience here at the lab with media, and there's a, a certain type of trope that people always go to when it comes to this area, which is the hacker with the black hoodie. Mm -hmm. And uh, right. I definitely wanted to avoid that. Um, I thought Nick would bring um, some better sensitivity to it. And uh, I, I think it ended up being just that, something that was more the human side of the story rather than, you know, somebody in a dark room tapping on a keyboard. Yeah, and it's, I mean, I've seen it. It's a fascinating documentary, and uh, I mean, it's so many relevant issues, obviously, to the, to the world we live in now. 
I mean, I wanted to, to end off by just asking a sort of a couple of questions because, I mean, it's uh, in just today in the news, um, the British Prime Minister is raising again, I think, in New York about um, social media companies and then companies like Google and whether whether they should be faced fines, for example, uh, for having information available about, say, how to make a bomb. And so this is a question that comes up um, in, in from some, uh, the sort of counter argument. Uh, I mean, when it comes to privacy, for instance, I mean, how do you do you think there should be an absolute right to privacy uh, or do you think that, you know, government, I mean, that you should be able to um, obviously communicate without having to worry about anyone listening? And, and I mean, how do you respond to criticism of that? enables yeah. not just terrorists, but child pornographers and others to take advantage of such things? Well, I, you know, I'd characterize myself as a kind of pragmatic liberal, and I think um, absolutes of any sort are, are, are not a good fit with that stance. Sure. And um, I, I'm, I'm a realist as well. I, I think that uh, obviously we're going through profound changes in how we communicate and um, uh, privacy is taking a huge hit. Um, mm. it's, it's at the heart of the exchange that we make with these social media companies who are providing us with these services for free. Uh, the exchange is that they monitor everything we do. And um, quite willingly, we've turned over um, fine-grained, detailed data about not only um, what we're doing online, but just about everything we do, even our, our habits, our thoughts, um, um, our social relationships, of course, where we are at any one time now, uh, all of these data points are vacuumed up and collected and companies um, have access to them. So I think privacy is under challenge uh, today in ways that really are um, uh, historically unprecedented. Um, <clears throat> at the same time, we know from you know the canons of liberal democracy that privacy is something that's ve very valuable. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to have um, a space to be able to think freely, to say things or do things that maybe challenge the status quo or conventions. Um, how we go about preserving privacy in this age, I think, is is um, certainly something I don't have uh, an easy answer for. Some people say, oh, we, you know, maybe there's some technology we could use, some encryption. Um, but uh, the reality is those are only partial solutions to a much right. broader uh, challenge. The other thing I'll say about this question is that there's a difference between um, threats to privacy and the erosions to privacy that are going on and um, the uh, prospect of the abuse of power when uh, both companies and governments have access to enormous capabilities of mass surveillance and they're not properly checked. That's not an right. issue of privacy. It's an issue of proper constraints, mm -hmm. mechanisms of control around government. And I think uh, across the industrialized world since 9-11, there's been a real rollback of, of mm -hmm. um, uh, some of those oversight mechanisms, while at the same time these enormous signals intelligence agencies, which used to just operate in the shadows, they're kind of, you know, a game of spy versus spy. Many of them, including in the UK now, are occupying positions of predominance over cybersecurity. They're the lead agencies. Um, their resources have skyrocketed. So we really need to th think this through in a, in a kind of architectural sense. Um, and, and this is not something new to the technology. These are uh, questions that go back really to, to ancient Greece as far as uh, I, I see it. Uh, just one final question more uh, for me than anyone else. I'm just curious about, I mean, I think we can all agree about uh, state surveillance against NGOs and, and individuals. What about state surveillance against other state and, and you know, governmental institutions? Can you make a case that in some, some examples, uh, say North Korea, that would actually be quite useful to know the thinking of the North Korean regime, how serious they are, that that might actually lead to avoiding war? If, if one was to know they were just posturing and not not serious, that actually a case could be made in, in some uh, instances that state surveillance is a, is a good thing. Yeah, I I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I you know we live in a world that can be a dangerous place, and we live in a world that's predominantly organized on the basis of sovereign states. I happen to live in Canada. Uh, I want my government to be well equipped and capable to deal with foreign threats. Um, and that requires uh, intelligence agencies that are well-resourced, 
Um, at the same time, of course, I believe they need to be properly um, governed. There needs to be proper oversight around those agencies, and that's what's often lacking. Uh, the mm-hmm. other thing I'll say about this is we're, we live in a very dangerous time, obviously, for many reasons. One of them is around uh, the insecurities caused by states who are engaging mm-hmm. in a kind of arms race in cyberspace. So it's one thing to engage in surveillance. It's another to take it a few steps uh, down that path towards um, uh, degrading and destroying infrastructure. Um, many governments have these capabilities within their armed forces now, and uh, there's a real risk that this could lead to, um, you know, uh, some kind of uh, wider, wider mm. uh, crisis or conflict. And I and I worry about that. We need to think about ways to restrain governments in, in cyberspace right. because it is a it is a shared environment, and I think looking at it from an arms control perspective is, is uh, quite healthy in this respect. I mean, I think that's one of the ironies that there's all this uh, talk about so-called cyber terrorism, but it's actually states that, that wield the most power when it comes to, to such weapons. And we've seen examples already of blowback where uh, NSA-designed um, malware and things are, are actually coming back um, to be used against, against the United States. Um, yeah. That, yeah, that's great. Sorry. I, you know, I just add to that, I think one area that I really worry about these days really wasn't covered in Black Code back in 2013. It wasn't a big issue, certainly not when I was writing the book a few years uh, earlier, um, is disinformation. Of course, you know, mm. you can't turn on, turn on the news or open a paper without hearing about fake news. Um, mm. You know, there's a trivial trivialness to the way it's talked about, but I, I think underlying it is something really disturbing, and that's how social media, um, the deluge of information that people experience on a day-to-day basis is an ecosystem that's ripe for the propagation of disinformation. Mm. And you have now governments that are obviously refining methods of uh, psychological operations, drawing from social science, social psychology theories, uh, even advertising, um, and combining it with um, well-resourced campaigns to influence how people think about uh, their options politically um, I, I find that to be really disturbing, and again, there's no simple solution for how to uh, get around it. Well, I mean, this is certainly uh, an excellent documentary and an excellent book and, and raises uh, so many important issues and, and issues, as you just mentioned, that are, are going to be continuing um, well into the future. Thank you so much uh, for, for joining me, and um, all, best wishes. Thank you very much, Stephen. Again, I apologize I couldn't. My schedule wouldn't allow me to be there in person. I really wish I could be there, and I hope everyone enjoys the film. Great. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye.